cultural revolution had begun and the sporting grounds for the movement was every single school in every town in every province in the country. All normal schooling had stopped and it had been replaced with a rigorous indoctrination campaign. All normal classes and school activities stopped and the study of Mao's quotations and the reading of the state-run newspaper had come to totally dominate school hours. Even during the ever-decreasing time spent not thinking about Mao Zedong thought, Loudspeakers would play People's Daily editorials at max volume the entire day, ensuring that not a moment went by where children weren't sponging up the propaganda with their malleable minds. Students were expected to engage in revolutionary activity, leading them to form their own cliques which they called Red Guards. The Red Guards for the most part were not run by anyone, but simply were the students' own creations. Together, they would practice drills, get politically active and make propaganda with what were known as big character posters, large white strips of paper contrasted by the confrontational words of rebellion in bold black ink. In an attempt to save the proletariat, the Red Guards would organize to discuss who the traitors to the revolution were, but naturally, as they were children, they weren't too familiar with adults outside of their parents and teachers. It would be the university students who would lead the way. Having more organizational skills and better knowledge of their immediate political environment, the university students were swift in their persecutions. First on the chopping block were the people who had been originally persecuted during the anti riotous campaigns six years ago. There was a time when Mao had petitioned the public, particularly the intellectuals, to provide critical feedback to the government to help them in their policy decisions. But in a bipolar change of mood, Mao ended up persecuting these volunteers, calling them rightists, as in referring to someone who is politically positioned on the right. These same people, most of whom were university faculty members, were at first taunted outside their class, met with student protesters who would heckle them during their classes, and finally, they would be held against their will and subjected to struggle sessions. A struggle session was the use of a dozen or more people to apply psychological and peer pressure to force someone to admit their guilt for something, whereby they would be forced to say or write out a self-criticism. As a greater percentage of the students became radicalized and the party propaganda of the People's Daily riled up people about an ongoing revolution with the oppressive capitalists, the struggle sessions would become more violent and lead to out of control situations fueled by the passions of the mob. Professors were punched and kicked and their heads shaved 
forced to kneel for hours at a time on grains of rice or glass until they made their self-criticism. Once the self-criticism has been made though, there is no turning back and their admission of guilt turns them into a greater class enemy than they were before. The same violent mob that attacked them the first time would be back every single day or week to ensure that they never forgot their guilt and they would be forced to go through the same humiliating rituals again and again. No teacher was safe. In university where normal classes were still being held, students would comb through every phrase and sentence of their professors to scan for counter-revolutionary or capitalist rhetoric. They would listen to what words he would emphasize, how he said it, why he brought up one subject and not another, and wonder how he came about such information. With one professor teaching hundreds of students per class and thousands of sets of eyeballs every week monitoring every word, every intonation, every glance, it only took one indignant student to leap up from his seat and yell out, Yo, great! In the mix of shock, horror, disgust, excitement and terror, every person had to make a calculated decision that would affect the rest of their lives. An accusation could be made by anyone at any time for any reason, no matter how utterly stupid it was. But to go against it could have been a death sentence and would invoke the same wrath of the mob that was once directed at the professor. Whether sincere or not, cowed by fear or motivated by bloodlust, the students one by one pricked up the courage to clear their voice and joined in on the tirade against the teacher for everything and anything, and barring that, relying on one-size-fits-all party-approved slogans, capitalist rota, counter-revolutionary, socialist bourgeoisie, bull demon, white snake. A large portion of the campus was added to the rank of the Red Guards who made such hostile activities a focus of their contribution to the revolution. No matter how timid and horrified, you Red Guards were infected with the same bloodlust by way of not wanting to stand out from the crowd, leading them eventually to become the one to make the first denunciation against someone or by hurling the first insult, being the first to accuse and eventually the first to land a physical blow. More often than not, the fear of being accused as a capitalist sympathizer was enough for some newbies to wind up surpassing their predecessors in cruelty. What became confined to the campuses eventually spilled out onto the streets. The professors who finished work would soon find that the revolution didn't finish when they clocked out at 5pm, but would be followed to the street where he would be continued to be heckled and harassed. Soon the professor would find no rest as his students protested outside their homes, vandalised their property and harassed their families. It would then be discovered that the revolution didn't stop even when they went home to rest. The ultimate culmination of this violent hostility was the house raid. In an orgy of bloodshed and senseless violence, the students would break into the accused home, taking the professor and frequently his whole family hostage while they rummaged through every item in his house to find more evidence of his capitalist or counter-revolutionary leanings. As in every case, evidence was always found, leading the accused of having all their possessions taken away one by one by the students. In that haven for radical youth, Shanghai alone saw a quarter of a million houses raided in such a fashion. The standard ritual was the break-in, then the looting, the denunciation, then the self-critique, and then the torture. The anguish of psychological torment and humiliation was mental torture enough that physical torture was no less horrifying. Whippings, burnings, electrocuting became the pastime of millions of youth around the country. Beijing would come to learn a new meaning of terror as cinemas and opera theatres were turned into torture chambers by these students. Typically people weren't suddenly plucked up and taken to these places, but after the humiliations at school, the harassment outside of it, and finally after the house raids, would victims find themselves kidnapped and strapped to a chair in the dark being tortured by their own students while they scream out their self-loathing statements of self-criticism. Outright murder was rare though. There was a report written to Mao from the Xinhua printing unit who said thus, quote, After this woman was labelled a counter-revolutionary, one day when she was doing forced labour and the guard turned his eyes away, she rushed up to the fourth floor in the woman's dormitory, jumped out of a window and killed herself. Of course, it is inevitable that the counter-revolutionaries should kill themselves, but it is a pity that we now have one less negative example. Mao wrote on this report, This is the best written report of all the similar reports I have read. Despite the horror of the Cultural Revolution, it doesn't have as many deaths as other atrocities during other periods in Chinese history. This is because a live scapegoat was imperative to continue to provide an enemy for the revolution. 
Such a notion was a key focus for the leaders of the Cultural Revolution, who knew that if all the supposed capitalist perpetrators were killed, there would be no enemy left to fight. The revolution wasn't one that was fought with a rifle to capture territory from an enemy. The objective was to capture the hearts and minds of the youth. Only by making even the most timid child violent towards his class enemies could he be immunized from the capitalist tricks for a lifetime and putting one bullet in one person was not sufficient to meet this end. For all those unfortunate scapegoats who sought death but did not find it, or desired to die but death fled from them, they would frequently resort to suicide. Knowing the full consequences of what a denunciation entailed, suicide upon the first accusation was not an uncommon thing and as time dragged on, the chances of suicide would climb higher and higher. The leading cause of death during the Cultural Revolution was not outright political murders nor famine, but suicide. People were tortured into insanity by the youth, with their career stripped from them, with their family potentially having turned on them, to be ridiculed constantly and made to cry out their guilt for simply existing. After having all their property taken and to be regularly tortured and humiliated publicly, many people simply cracked. Key in Mao's Cultural Revolution was the elimination of the socialist pretenders within his own party, or as he called them, socialist bourgeoisie. Mao's strategy can be described as flooding the whole world to kill his enemies living at the top of the tallest mountains. He wanted the heads of Zhou Enlai, Liu Xiaoqi, Deng Xiaoping and all the other officials who had disagreed with him, and any innocent person who got caught up in his own power struggle was just collateral damage. Red Guard-like factions within the Communist Party formed in a similar fashion to the Red Guard units, often being referred to as rebel groups. They, like their Red Guard counterparts, were the organized wing of fanaticism and terror within the Communist Party's organs which had tens of millions of members. These rebel cliques would have more ability than the street side youth to more directly persecute Mao's actual enemies within the party, whilst at the same time they ascended up the ranks owing to their devotion. Following the overall trend of the university students, the high school, middle school and elementary school students would be hypnotized by the same insanity and now many of the school teachers would suffer the same fate. In the People's Daily, Mao directly reached out to the school-aged youth calling for the smashing of the examination system which was in fact the nefarious creation of the bourgeoisie. Some teachers had found sneaky ways to avoid denunciation, perhaps by emphasizing their proletarian class background, but for the most part, school teachers became the most persecuted group in China during the Cultural Revolution. With their very own teachers having been agents of evil all along, schools came to be run almost entirely by the school students themselves and a few captive teachers. Despite the state of dysfunction, school students along with the teachers would obediently go to school every day like it was just another day, but upon arriving to school for another day of hard work, the teachers would be detained by their teenage captors, given a fresh beating and perhaps forced to help with the administrative aspects of running the school. In practically every school in the entire nation, teachers were rounded up by the students and locked in classrooms. Headmasters were tied up, beaten, tortured and in many cases outright murdered by the school children. The teachers acquiesced to their students' demand because the culture and Mao himself was on their side. They were left to their fate. Many students sought the safety of their own parents by denouncing their teacher, but with teachers getting fewer and fewer, they settled for other adults perhaps the parents of their schoolmates. But at the same time, frequently, in the euphoria of hate and perhaps a hint of revenge, children turned in their own parents, forcing them to their schools and having them subjected to the senseless violence of their peers. The Cultural Revolution had brutalized human relationships and alienated countless families. No adult was safe from the children. Although the Red Guards were essentially leaderless, there was generally a certain pecking order amongst the cliques, and just like in a high school cafeteria, some Red Guard cliques were more popular, powerful and influential than others. The most powerful Red Guard factions were operated by the powerful children of the privileged party elite. Frequently, these privileged kids had some sense of inherent class guilt they inherited from their parents, leading them to overcompensating to the point of being some of the most brutally savage of all the Red Guards. People in China were referred to as either red, grey or black. Red was the colour of someone of proletariat background or a party official. Grey was someone of an ambiguous background, perhaps their father was a shop clerk. Then there was black, referring to a capitalist. 
which pretty much included everything else. Because of someone's family background, dating back two generations was the primary way people came to evaluate each other's political status, the elite Red Guard's official backgrounds were notorious for their bullying. In every school, children of the black and grey were horribly abused by children of the red. The red children used the black and grey children as forced labour, making them sweep the school grounds, clean the toilets, bow their heads in public at all times, and accept the lecturing of any red guard at any moment. The black and grey children were surveilled throughout the school day to ensure they don't secretly carry out oppressive capitalist activities, and at the end of the day, they had to report their thoughts to their red guard classmates. School children were committing suicide at astounding levels due to the abuse, but instead of empathy, suicide was considered an omission of guilt for their secretly counter-revolutionary ways, justifying the actions of their classmates who had driven them to suicide. Like a storm of irony without end, the powerful Red Guard children of the party elite would frequently end when their own parents would fall under the crucible of persecution, causing their own downfall within their clique and become the subject of denunciations themselves. As teachers remained locked in their cages, detained in dugout pits, and tortured in abandoned theatres, the young captors only had one innocent dream in mind, to please the chairman and they finally got their wish. Mao announced his official endorsement of the Red Guards in the party press for the first time, whipping the zealous students into euphoric frenzy for to be directly addressed by their idol, it was like receiving God's approval for their hard work. On the 18th of August 1966, 13 million Red Guard youth flocked to Tiananmen Square to attend one of six rallies. Mao's right-hand man, Lin Biao, announced to the swathe of bloodthirsty youngsters to smash the four olds. Old ideas, old cultures, old customs, and old habits. The peak of the frenzy came when Mao Zedong stepped onto the podium and conversed with Red Guard leader Song Bin Bin in front of a pulsating crowd. Mao asked what her name was, to which the youth replied Song Bin Bin, which could be translated as Song the Polite. Amongst the millions of gleaming followers, Mao looked at her disapprovingly and said to her, Your name should be Song the Militant. Only a few weeks later, Song would lead a rebellion at her Beijing-based high school, and upon capturing the school's headmaster, would beat her to death with a stick. The words of Mao to Song Bingbin caused the youth to go berserk, and Beijing would be turned upside down. Hundreds of thousands of fanatics would pour into the streets and smash any statues, any sculptures, any paintings or antiques they could get their hands on, whilst accusing their owners of being class traders. These class traders would then be forced to wear a dunce hat or a kung and be paraded through the streets where they would be met with the abuse of hundreds of people. It either ended in their detention by the Red Guards, torture, murder or their suicide. If they survived the ordeal, they would be met with scathing abuse every waking moment, losing their jobs, their families, their friends, and even all their possessions. The intellectuals and the artists were severely affected and frequently committed suicide, watching their life's work being burnt to ashes or smashed pieces. Soon, nearly all private collections and treasures were destroyed. Museums were raided. Palaces, temples, ancient tombs, statues, pagodas, city walls were ransacked. In the People's Daily, Mao praised these heroic acts of rebellion and encouraged the nation to support them. The persecution then expanded to landlords, who for the Marxists were considered capitalism personified. Although private property had been abolished 20 years beforehand, information was dug up about people's past, and if they had ever owned any property, even if it was 50 years ago, their fate would be sealed. The same was true for anyone who was potentially involved with the Kuomintang nationalists, who had conceded defeat almost 20 years prior. At a humongous rally on the 15th of September, Lin Biao announced on his podium, quote, Red Guard fighters, the direction of your battles has always been correct. You have soundly, heartily, battered the capitalist rodents, the revolutionary bourgeoisie authorities, the bloodsuckers and parasites. You have done the right thing, and you have done marvelously. This is followed by deafening cheers, fanatical shouts of love for Chairman Mao, and tears of joy, and standing out amongst the chanting were the words, one sway, one sway, 
one one sway. Ten thousand years, ten thousand years, ten thousand years. A slogan that was unmistakably, exclusively used for the emperor since ancient times, meant to call for the emperor's rule for another ten thousand years. People were also beginning to kowtow to portraits of Mao in the same vein one would with the emperor. There was no doubt that after only 55 years from the fall of the Qing Emperor that a new emperor had been coronated. The existential, god-sized void that had existed since the fall of the cult of the emperor had finally been filled and whether out of fame or infamy, Mao galvanized his position amongst the pantheon of gods and emperors for the rest of Chinese history. With the support of Mao, Red Guards took on the role of detectives, who worked hand in hand with the police in order to dig up people's past. The police under Mao's control gave to the Red Guards previously confidential information about all the people in the past that had ever been punished for political reasons. Mao told his police chief, Xue Fuzhi, not to be bound by the old rules, no matter if they'd been set by the police authorities or the state. Xue Fuzhi stated to his comrades, quote, I'm not in favor of beating people to death, but if some red guards hate the class enemies so much that they want to kill them, you want force to stop them. As a result, waves of beatings and torture swept the country, particularly during the aforementioned house raids, where victims were forced to kneel to their red guard overlords and endure their beatings. There was a great thrill many children felt from having power over the adults, and they reveled in being handed the tools of tyranny. The supposed secret oppressive institutions within society that they were summoned to fight against gave them permission to become oppressors in turn, an irony completely lost on them, as it was such actions that fulfilled their ambition to attain power for themselves. For them, unlike the oppressive capitalists, only they had a right to be oppressive to others. The Red Guards would go around and change the name of streets, making sure to remove any capitalist sounding words and replacing it with Maoist slogans. Shops whose names retained capitalist sounding characters or contained references to China's past were smashed. For instance, having the very common character, Jin, in your store name would be enough to have bricks thrown through your window. The traffic around the country also ground to a halt. Red stoplights came to be identified as counter-revolutionary by the youth. Red, being the symbol of the revolution and thus the symbol of progress, ran contrary to the notion that red should mean stop. As such, drivers were forced to now stop when it was green and drive when it was red. Worse yet, people were pulled over by the young students who commanded them to drive on the left side as opposed to the right side because socialists are left wing and capitalists are right wing. Not everyone got the message though, causing car crashes in almost every major street and blocking up the roads. Behaviours such as gentleness and politeness were now considered bourgeoisie and not suited to the Cultural Revolution. So the Red Guards were swollen with menace. One could easily be attacked if someone so much as gave a thank you or excuse me. Such a person would be branded as a bourgeois hypocrite. This is why younger generations today accuse the older generation of having no manners as courtesy had gone extinct for that generation. For Mao, the teenage operated Red Guards were his ideal shock troops and agents. They were naturally rebellious, self-conscious and approval seeking, and keen to seek direction offered by an older male role model and above all, unlike the wretched Khrushchevs in his own party, the children would follow him to the ends of the earth. Like a real war, the one they faced was marked by a mix of peak adrenaline and monotony. Students were compelled to attend school despite the end of formal education and lazed about doing either nothing or taking political action and with fewer and fewer enemies left to fight and the growing confusion about who was and who wasn't a capitalist rota, naturally they would turn on themselves and schools would become a war zone of competing Red Guard factions. Such fights could be sparked over trivial personal disputes or varying interpretations of Mao Zedong thought. These factional struggles across schools and universities all across the country would start in the summer of 1967, hardly a year after the Cultural Revolution officially began, and for want of enemies, these young radicals were left to cannibalize each other. The fighting ranged from roving gangs of elementary age school children having fistfights after school, to full-on gangland style wars involving automatic weapons, grenades, machine guns, mortars and tanks? That escalated quickly. How'd the kids get these things? 
In one of Mao's many gushing showings of support for the Red Guards and the People's Daily, in January 1967, he openly called for the People's Liberation Army to arm the young students for self-defense, all the while not telling the army which factions to support. As such, armories were simply left open as kids fixed bayonets to rifles, teams manned machine guns, while older kids climbed into tanks. They were joined by fellow Red Guard units from within the army who came in support of their brothers by offering them technical assistance and experienced firepower. There were Red Guard factional wars in every province by different cliques and over different reasons, frequently very trivial reasons at that. Some of the worst fighting was in Sichuan, where a large amount of China's armories and weapons factories lay. What started as name calling and fisticuffs exploded into a clumsily operated modern conventional war by fanatical youth against one another. The army, which had become not much more than a political institution by this stage, gave weapons and equipment to practically anyone who asked. But Mao would finally meet a roadblock. Someone said no. Every single aspect of society had totally capitulated to Mao, but there was one place where he hadn't fully gained control. Although Lin Biao had been installed into position over the People's Liberation Army, he wasn't respected at the upper command level. The purging of Peng Douhuai had soured a lot of military officers against Mao, and unlike the power of the party officials that fell prey to Mao, the military officers' power was tied to kinetic force, and as such, holdouts of resistance remained strong. The army sent planes over Chengdu, showering the city with leaflets, ordering the students to go home and to put an end to the fighting. This was the first sign to the public that Mao and the party slash army were at such dire odds with each other, and that the revolution was far more wide-reaching than they had realized. Unfortunately, Mao simply used this opportunity to identify who it was that put their heads up to speak out so they could be purged once and for all, replacing them with rebel fanatics. And so the flow of arms continued pouring out into the streets. Mao's goal was to harness the violent chaos to be directed at his political opponents who teetered on the brink. It was not so simple though. Although the party officials lacked the kinetic power of the army, their skillful wielding of political power made them very tough opponents to defeat. Having honed their survival skills for decades thanks to political infighting, these veterans had their own strategies. Party officials would form alliances with street-level Red Guard factions by way of sharing party privilege or gaining control of their own cliques through their children. Controlling a Red Guard clique was imperative for survival in this political landscape and was often justified by saying, raising the red flag to fight the red flag. Of all the factual fighting of the Cultural Revolution, the most shocking was the one in Guangxi that led to what came to be known as the Guangxi Massacre. In March 1967, two Red Guard factions had emerged to the fore in Guangxi, the United Headquarters faction and the 422 faction who engaged in ferocious fighting. Like all the other factional quarrels, the dull students had been duped into believing that the enemy they were fighting was the famed counter-revolutionary force that the party propaganda was always talking about, when in reality, it was essentially a political struggle between Wei Guoqing, a high-ranking party member, and Zhou Enlai. The United Headquarters faction supported Wei Guoqing in becoming the Cultural Revolutionary Authority in Guangxi, while the 422 faction also supported him but wanted him to do a self-criticism first. Zhou Enlai provided political cover for 422 while he in turn received the street level support of their faction. Because of political power emerging out of the grassroots level, rebel groups and soldiers would join such Red Guard factions to gain protection and get action in fighting the real counter-revolutionaries, while in turn they provided military or political support. Things started to get kinetic when the regional military sided with the United Headquarters faction and announced that the 422 clique was the real counter-revolutionary force. Unable to withstand the firepower of a professional military, the 422 clique were brutally executed, resulting in a massacre of 150,000 people. They were killed by beheading, beating, life burial, stoning, drowning, boiling and disembowelment. According to Yen Le Bin, member of the Ministry of Public Security who investigated the incident at a later date, quote, In 1968, 38 people in Wuxuan County were eaten, and 113 officials of the county participated in the eating of human flesh, hearts, and livers. Chen Guo Rong, 
a peasant from Guigang County who happened to pass by Wuxian was caught and killed by local militia because he was fat. His heart and liver were taken out while his flesh was distributed to 20 people. A female militia leader ate six human livers in total and cut the genitals of five men and soaked them in alcohol which she would drink later, claiming that these organs were beneficial to her health. The behavior of eating human flesh, hearts and livers occurred in many counties of Guangxi. The young teenage boys who made up the ranks of the Red Guards of Guangxi were particularly inhuman. In one case, according to official records, a person had dynamite bound to their backs and was blown to pieces just for fun. Such random acts of violence committed for entertainment was not uncommon at the time. They also report that in 1968, quote, a geography instructor named Wu Shufang was beaten to death by students at Wu Xuan Middle School, was carried to the flatstones of the Qian River, where another teacher was forced at gunpoint to rip out her heart and liver, with which the students took back to the school to barbecue and eat. Mao would chime in with his opinion about the factionalism and the armed conflict in the People's Daily, saying, quote, It is not a bad thing to let the young have some practice in using arms. We haven't had a war in so long, end quote. Madame Mao would go further and say that, that the factional fighting that was occurring was an extension of the struggle between the communists and the Kuomintang, without specifying which group was which. With revolutionaries fighting other revolutionaries who they accused of being counter-revolutionary, Mao had achieved his goal, total chaos and endless revolution.